Here was a point about nuclear that really is not in the discussion, but is a huge hidden factor. You know, nuclear remains the foremost energy challenge to human ingenuity due to its impressive and fear-worthy capabilities. Anything that possesses supernatural powers is intriguing to humans by default, whether it's forces of Mother Nature, the power of leaders, technology, etc. This is why nuclear is sought. Other power sources that have been mastered are boring and really not in the class of nuclear. That is why it continues to be pursued by humans, and there's a motivation to continue nuclear. It is impressive in some ways beyond our capacity really to comprehend. So until a stronger and more amazing advancement comes along, like fusion power, for example, nuclear ambitions will be sought because it is on the edge of human capabilities. That tempting desire to mastery, harnessing, testing the limits of supernatural technology will continue really to be a tailwind for nuclear. All other forms of energy that we use today are just ineffective compared to nuclear and to future sources like fusion. That's why wind, solar, hydro, biomass, geothermal, and the rest of easy forms of energy won't prevail as dominating source going forward. Well, let's get into it. So how can the U.S. really lead the way on nuclear energy globally when its own domestic capacity is crumbling and overall policy is energy confused, lazy, and misguided? Well, it will be no easy task. And uh, at this point, it's really next to impossible, but, but certainly there's still a little bit of uh, light and potential. Now, to their credit, you know, some actions have recently been taken uh, really to uh, support nuclear, but it is still not nearly enough. But before we attempt to offer a roadmap to a solution, let's look at the global nuclear stage uh, as it stands today uh, for a moment from another view. Now, Rosatom is no doubt in a standalone position. From about 2006 to 2018, Rosatom made 14 reactor connections over 13 years. Call it a one gigawatt reactor per year. Half of those projects were in foreign markets. Now, Rosatom's nuclear reactor order book now stands at about 133 billion US dollars. I point out that all of that is in foreign markets and about 25% of that figure is in the fuel cycle supply chain, another key area that has to do with conversion, enrichment, and fabrication control. Now, Rosatom is doing work with excellent efficiencies and standardization. They are offering turnkey deals to their clients at competitiveness around every corner and at every piece of the puzzle. Meanwhile, as a result of their efforts, the costs and times are coming down substantially. Rosatom's VVER 1 gigawatt and 1.2 gigawatt units are seeing construction times between five to seven years at capital costs in the four to five billion US dollar range. China's National Nuclear Corp and CGN are seeing similar results around the five to six year range with capital costs coming in potentially near 3 billion US dollars per gigawatt. South Korea and France are still in the fight a little bit. You have to ask yourself, where is Australia in this? Uh, really, where is Canada? But more so, where is the United States in all of this uh, once a nuclear energy dominant leader? In the US, a uh, few problems. Um, I would say really kind of asleep at the wheel, which is really sad. But look, I've attended some meetings with agencies and watched some of their moves over the past few years. And while a little bit of effort is being made, it's nowhere near, as I've said, what is really needed. They are really too comfortable, which is not reassuring. Significant policy adoptions really need to take place with all means and methods if we are to improve industry-wide supply chain. Those policies must start with an immediate direct action coming from the legislative and executive branches of the government. How can the U.S. remain dominant without real energy leadership? Well, that's a good question. We see that it is best to start with a top-down approach to seeing the matters at hand. If the United States is to have a significant grip on worldwide nuclear supply chain and be a leader in nuclear technology, it must be the leader in foreign nuclear policy. Although the domestic industry has become severely ineffective, the capabilities for considerable expansion exist and the expertise is still here. It must be utilized now or the situation will go from bad to worse, degraded to depleted. We suggest the federal government immediately begin formulating what we would call global strategic nuclear energy policy to provide a clear path to regaining the majority market share of nuclear energy, both abroad and domestically. 
And really to win this energy war, the key battle starts in the foreign markets. I want to point out here that the U.S. has no foreign order book to compete and its lack of nuclear power health at home is not looked upon favorably from foreign perspective clients. Furthermore, the U.S. still likes to try and dictate terms about fuel cycle and enrichment restrictions. The problem with this is that these breakdowns in deal making leads to what was a prospective client over to the competition who will then make deals that the U.S. failed to make. In reality, it's a lose-lose for the U.S. because there is little leverage when the competition offers superior terms. And the problems really continue. You know, with the slow progress that has been made with the current administration and the incoming administration, the Nuclear Fuel Working Group Framework Report, you know, all these other little small efforts. The fact is nobody in these positions of power know if they're going to have a job at this point. And now it appears that that is going to be the case. New folks are coming in and out with the old. But let me remind you that all the recent efforts can be undone quite quickly if the incoming administration decides to shake things up. So the politics blow like the wind, which adds to U.S. nuclear uncertainty. However, I'd say the nuclear tide is turning firmly in the right direction as more people wake up and realize how critical nuclear power is and how no other form of energy can match really what nuclear provides. You know, fusion, molten salt reactors, thorium, we all know that these are long-term, high capital cost R&D projects that are decades and decades away. We need to focus on existing proving pressurized water reactor technology that we can deploy now. Once the nuclear industry has returned to a position of strength, then let's look to accelerate new technologies when the industry actually has full health. We can throw all the money we want at fusion technology, but none of this will become reality for decades to come, if not much more. So stop with the new designs and the inefficiencies that cause high cost, long lead time, and regulatory debacles. Once the industry is healthy and large capital investments are coming in from the private sector, then new tech should be the focus, but only when we've mastered our existing technology. The industry has got to compete for talent, and that starts at the high school, university levels, in addition to attracting talent from related industries. Talent transfer programs are needed. That means good people who are leaving need to transfer their wisdom to incoming people. We've got to facilitate that. Next to nothing is being done regarding real comprehensive efforts by federal agencies and the domestic industry, even private enterprise, and even the global industry to lay out the facts about nuclear. Until we have an or equal or superior form of energy, we've only got nuclear. So get the truth out. But really, how can we do that when the industry is not healthy in the first place? So definitive strategy is needed. We like to call it global strategic nuclear energy policy. Get together on this issue, not only to compete in global nuclear energy, but for gathering the tools to neutralize global energy impact on the environment. What are we going to do? Fill our lands with solar fields? and our oceans with wind turbines that have a huge footprint and a worn out battery component waste cycle every 10 to 20 years? Capitalize and incentivize investment banks like the International Development Finance Corporation, even domestic and foreign banks to pursue the funding of nuclear projects globally. Get the industry from uranium miners to fuel cycle makers, engineers, manufacturers, constructors, and utilities on the same page. You do that by offering incentive and through the pursuit of profit, a return, some form of value. Last, you've got to cut out the dysfunctional and near frozen red tape of regulation where it makes no sense. Standardization and repeatability must be a cornerstone in the policies. So look, 50% growth in 30 years, is that really ambitious? Not really at 1.7% per year. Small modular reactors, efficient and standardized conventional reactors, whole industry and government support with select deregulation and administratively challenged jurisdictions are the key to exceeding this goal. Pass the policy through the government and get the funding distributed to the banks, industry, and to administering agencies, ASAP. Make the 30-year program irrevocable so that it can be executed without disruption by stupidity. Put in some protections, some checks and balances so that the strategic policy can be independently administered by the industry and the government in partnership together. One of the things that we lack today, partnership between government and private enterprise. It needs to happen. It can't be the government. It can't be a private enterprise by itself. There has to be a, a middle ground. Motivate and incentivize. 
Because of the nature of nuclear, this strategic policy must be heavily backed by the government by providing a platform for, for private industry to take over in the future at the end of the program. So that means tax incentives, offtake power purchase agreements. There are just a few of many ways to grease the gears of industry. The strategic interest of energy and the influence it brings has to be important to the government. We've seen this with Russia and their ambitions. So it starts with the U.S. government. They have to front the strategy in a big hundreds of billions of dollars way. You know, we need to really focus on the pressurized water reactor. This is the most proven and most constructed design. Stop changing it. We know it works. Navy reactors, battleships, carriers, submarines, proven designs when it comes to SMRs. They're highly accurate and high quality, built to withstand the toughest conditions. That's why the Model 1911 semi-automatic pistol has enjoyed 110 years of service. It works great after 100 plus years. Yet all of this stuff are built generally by the low bidder. The point is repeated use of the same proven equipment. Efficiencies are found in consistent repetition. Mastery. It's like Big Macs, a Coke, and a large fry from McDonald's. They remain consistent no matter where you are on Earth. Now, I want to point to New Scale Power for a moment. For the U.S., New Scale SMR projects, they estimate 48 months from construction to first commercial operation. In emerging jurisdictions, New Scale estimates the same as the U.S. and potentially faster. A New Scale project utilizing 12 60 megawatt power modules has a capital cost of about $3,600 per kilowatt. That's a price tag of under $3 billion and could be less depending on the jurisdiction. The footprint of a project this size, one half of one tenth of a square mile or about 30 acres. Just imagine how much land a solar project of equal size and uptime would need. I'll leave that to you uh, to figure out. The procurement process should be twofold. Domestic utilities in partnership with industry to seek out nuclear power deals with foreign partners and governments who seek to deploy nuclear power in their own country. and U.S. agency-led relationships in which the department secures a client and in turn holds a competitive bid process based on negotiated best value with domestic enterprises. The awarded firm builds the project under contract with the agencies or directly with the client using department-led financing packages with banking institutions. Better terms must be offered than the competition. The U.S. must be on all fronts. While doing so, the U.S. can gain influence and control by carefully supplying the fuel cycle while making certain concessions to maintain fuel cycle trade secrets. Normalize costs and lead times. It's about standardization. Why can't we build and repeat? Why can't we build conventional PWRs in less than six years? Why can't it be four to five years? Why can't we keep the costs at four to $5,000 per kilowatt? Why can't we do better? Permitting times. Why do we have longer permitting time than an emerging nation when we should be approving pre-existing, approvable PWR designs? It's appalling to me to see other countries, emerging nations, who are much less developed than the U.S., have permitting times that are much faster and processes that are much more efficient. We've buried ourselves in red tape, burdensome paperwork, and regulation due to bureaucracy. Most U.S. nuclear power plants were built between 1970 and 1990. That was 70 units in 20 years, or another way, three and a half reactors each year with focus towards the latter half of that period. What is wrong with us today? We can't even compete with our prior successes. They set the bar very high and they did a great job. So consolidate the focus to the key economic drivers. This is really about mastery. It's about majority market share and it's about walking before we can run. You know, the most important effective solution here is a comprehensive strategic nuclear energy policy that puts the United States back in the leading role of worldwide energy competition. This will lead to full domestic restoration, expansion, and growth over the long term. The positive economic activities will be staggering for domestic industry, thus resulting in department, state, and federal government-wide benefits. This solves the price issues. It solves the human resource talent issues and will even positively influence a regulatory attitude that is much better than what we're experiencing today. The least effective action will be to play around with a smaller bit of capital, 
and constraining policies with regards to a few domestic industry components. This type of action will not lead to any long-term health, capability, capacity, and the sustainability of an industry that needs to be sought. This is the only real viable solution that addresses the greatest challenge U.S. energy policy has faced, which is being the standout leader in nuclear. Supplemental benefits will be realized toward impacting environmental challenges, things like better energy being the cornerstone of creating clean water, solving food problems, solving poverty problems, reducing pollution, and setting global energy on a path towards substantial progress. You know, no other form of energy can lead like U.S. nuclear energy. This is a substantial undertaking by which there is not a moment to lose, and the work must be progressed expeditiously and with precision. The United States used to be capable of reaching these types of objectives. Sometimes I'm not so sure anymore, but it can be done again. We must be near perfect in our approach as there are hungry, savvy competitors seeking to further displace U.S. influence in crucial energy frontiers, which, if left unchallenged, is to the detriment of the United States economic and nuclear interests. Now is the time to eliminate the complacency. It's time to get off your chair and get to work. It's time to act with leadership, motivation, urgency, and sound calculated strategy. Well, thank you for tuning into this presentation. A lot of ground has been covered in such a small amount of time. A special thanks to Jay Serena over at New Scale Power for some very attractive data and estimates coming out of the New Scale work. Also, a thanks to Brandon Monroe at Bannerman Resources for adding some useful information when putting this presentation together. Please reach out if you have any questions and uh, stay well. Take care.